name is Elselijn Kingma. I'm a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Southampton. I actually ended up here and in philosophy via a really strange route. I studied medicine at undergrad back in the Netherlands and knew nothing about philosophy. And then I went to the University of Cambridge to do an MPhil in history and philosophy of science. We really loved philosophy, stayed for a PhD, and that's how I ended up in England and in philosophy. And I ended up in Southampton by quite a detour. So I did a postdoc in the USA in the National Institutes of Health. I then did another postdoc at King's College London, worked for a while in Cambridge again, applied all over the place uh, for jobs as you do in philosophy and got a job at the University of Southampton. So what I do here at the university as a lecturer is I do three kinds of things. I teach, I do administration, which I won't bore you with, uh, and I do research. So in terms of my teaching, uh, I my area is philosophy of science. So I teach a course in philosophy of science. I teach a course uh, that's kind of philosophy of science and ethics of science for science students called Jekyll and Hyde. I teach a course in kind of biomedical ethics types issues for our medical students, which of course relates really well to my own background in medicine. I enjoy that. I teach a course in practical ethics, which is quite biomedical ethicsy, and I teach a course in gender, feminism, and philosophy. And in terms of my research, my research is on concepts of health and disease, uh, on the metaphysics of pregnancy, and on uh, ethical issues surrounding pregnancy and birth. So one of the courses I teach is the third year course in gender, feminism and philosophy. Uh, this is a course I really enjoy teaching. It actually falls slightly outside of my area of research. I only ended up teaching this course because I was teaching at a different university where the person who always taught this course uh, had to leave. There was nobody else to teach the course. They were going to cut the course. I care a lot about feminism, so I thought that would be a shame, and so I decided to offer to teach the course, although I knew very little about it, uh, and I had to educate myself. Um, it's a course I greatly enjoy teaching. It's also really popular with students because it's very contemporary and very applied. Um, one of the things I try to do is I try and pick up on kind of currently controversial issues. So one of the things I always do, I think uh, two summers ago now, there was the Blurred Line video, uh, and song by, I can't even remember what his name, oh, Robert Thicke, I think, um, which got a lot of flack online for lots of reasons and various spoofs got made as well. And one of the things I do with this video, the spoofs, is I illustrate the very different takes people can take on what gender is, which is one of the type of concerns um, that comes up uh, in that course. So that's always um, uh, great fun. So one of the two angles that I particularly uh, try to bring to the course is I, I really try to uh, uh, raise and emphasize one of the issues, which is what feminism has to offer uh, to men and what the role of men is in feminism. So I think there's a great risk with this course and in general that you'd only attract women. And I think feminism in general is at risk of only appealing to women. It can have this image of just being for women and all being about men hating. My line on this is, it's one of the things I discuss in the course, that I don't think feminism in principle has to be like that. So being concerned about gender equality, one of the things we discuss in the course is what is feminism, right? Is feminism something about women or is it feminism just uh, gender equality? Um, I think that should appeal to men as well as women because men can be just as much the victim of gendered expectations in our society as women are. So to give an example, my, my partner, um, is always really concerned that if he's on his own with, with our small children, that people will think he's some paedophile. He just notices he doesn't get treated in the same way, nor respected in the same way as a carer of children as I am. I think that is hugely problematic, and I think that is enormously unfair. And I think that is a feminist issue. Uh, it's just the flip side of um, what we might think of as the glass ceiling as the workplace is what I like to call the iron curtain, which is the, you know, maybe the glass curtain would be better, is the, the banning of men from, say, the domestic sphere, the family, and not giving them the recognition when they uh, do those kind of things, or recognizing them as just as authoritative when it comes to their own children. When it comes to children, People always assume that a mother, because she's a woman, would somehow have the last say or the decision power. And I think if you have a very equal marriage, as I have, uh, that is really problematic when people constantly assume that it will be up to me to decide important decisions about our children. 
my partner is just as capable of this as he is. So that is one thing I kind of talk about, right? About whether feminism is or can be sexist and what the role, uh, what feminism can do for men or what the role of men um, uh, in feminism is. And one thing that you then do notice, I think, is that feminism has been at risk of disproportionately focusing for, for in part good reasons of the ways that women suffer from gender equality and just not spending quite as much time on some of the ways men suffer from gender inequality and I think you would need to solve both those right you need to break the glass ceiling in the workplace but you also then that can only happen if you also break whatever barriers men face if they want to take more uh, time with their children or want to work in a nursery or anything like those things so that's something I'm quite interested in um, as part of the course uh, another thing that we do in the course or actually what we do in the course is you know I pick up a lot of themes that often get bandied about and, and this is of course what philosophy does is we unpick them and we think about them really carefully one example of this is the so one example of this is the sex gender distinction this is a term that gets used a lot and there are lots of different interpretations of them there's a lot of questions to be asked about what exactly that means but we also look at for example a term like objectification what is the objectification of women this is a term that gets uh, again uh, uh, thrown around a lot and there are a lot of very interesting philosophical theories about how exactly we should understand such a claim like what does it mean to objectify something um, and that's not easy to understand I mean there are different uh, there are different uh, there are different understandings of this is an understanding that goes back to Kant which is all about treating something as an object uh, but there's a very different and I think very interesting analysis by somebody called Sally Haslanger, a female philosophy, philosoph a female philosopher, who says that to objectify somebody is to adopt uh, a particular person's viewpoint and impose that as the neutral viewpoint. So the idea of this is that what we do is we take the way that men see the world as the neutral and objective way to see the world. And because men tend to see women as at least partially uh, sex objects or um, I should say heterosexual men see women partially as sex objects or uh, humans who always have this component of being sexually interesting we kind of manage because heterosexual men traditionally have been powerful we impose their point of view on the world as the neutral point of view so the neutral point of view is to view women as sexually interesting whereas even though men might well appear to be sexually interesting to heterosexual women their point of view always remains their private point of view a man might look sexually interesting to me but it's not the case that it's kind of a feature of the man to be sexually interesting per se because that's not the neutral point of view whereas women being sexually interesting kind of becomes a feature of them because to see them that way has been posited as the objective neutral view of you in the world. I think that's a really interesting analysis of what objectification is. So one of the main strands of my research, uh, this is a new strand, I'm actually very excited, I've just I've been awarded a 1.3 million euro grant for this. It's a project that is called BUMP, Better Understanding the Metaphysics of Pregnancy. And this project is about the metaphysical relationship between the fetus and the mother. Uh, and what I mean by metaphysics is kind of the nature of the relationship. So what you find very widely in society, and this is very well described, is that we have this construal and portrayal of the fetus as a baby within a mother, right? Where it's kind of a separate creature living in but not being part of um, the rest of the person. And I want to investigate whether the image kind of holds up, whether that's true. So I ask questions like, is the fetus a part of the maternal organism uh, or is it not? And for that, I look at accounts of the organism in philosophy and biology. I ask uh, if it is a part of the maternal organism, which is what I argued, then what does that mean for us as persons? Does that mean that your um, baby used to be a part of you uh, as a woman? Does that mean that we used to be a part of our mother? What does that mean for our um, in 
intergenerational relations? What does that mean for the way that we construe ourselves as individuals? What does it mean for when you started? So these are the kind of questions that I'm very interested in. Uh, and this is a really exciting piece of research. Uh, one of the really interesting things about this research is that it's been so overlooked in philosophy. So pregnancy and birth are obviously not liminal, weird, unusual states. I mean, this is how every single one of us comes to be. And you'd think that an awful lot of philosophy would be uh, focused on how do we come to be, right? What is this very interesting nine month process, which is quite long, where you seem to get this intertwinement or, you know, in a very intimate relationship between a mother and offspring. But there is virtually no uh, consideration of this. So what you get is a huge amount of focus on abortion and the personhood and the feet of the fetus, but that is kind of drowned out almost any other concern. And I think one thing that goes on there, and this I think is interesting for the, the history of women's equality, is that of course the vast majority of even contemporary philosophers, but especially historically influential philo philosophy figures, were men, right? Were not people that were pregnant. And in fact, were predominantly men who were just about as far removed from pregnancy in a domestic sphere um, as they could be, right? Because they might have been in monasteries or in Oxford colleges, or they might have been ancient Greeks who thought that the highest form of love was with other men. Um, so pregnancy just wasn't really part, I think, of the what was an obvious thing to think about, especially not from a first person perspective for the vast majority of uh, historical philosophers. So where something like, you know, death is a huge philosophical topic, birth and pregnancy are virtually absent. Uh, and that's one of the things I'm trying to change.